Philippians chapter 1 verses 3 to 11. This is the Apostle Paul and uh, he's, he's actually speaking. This is the first church that Paul established in Asia and this is where you're know, in in this European area he comes and he's actually now in chains he's not there but he's established this church it says in fact in verse 1 to all the saints in Christ well you know if we didn't become saints we'd still be sinners and like worms and not really expect anything much from God but you know this is where we understand we, when we become believers we we come out of the idea of being a worm who is groveling around on the on the ground like just a servant of God that we become saints we become princes and princesses in the kingdom we have been elevated through Christ through his blood we have got his righteousness now and that makes us saints in the kingdom and he says to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi and then he also shows us how the church has been established because he says with the bishops and deacons so this was a very substantial work there were bishops and deacons he'd been there he'd established this work he had been teaching them but there's ongoing teaching because unfortunately they started to squabble like most people in church they have their little squabbles and they have things that, that offend them and, and we are, as I say, we're not robots and there's obviously lots of people who are baby Christians who really need their nappies changed regularly because they haven't developed the grace they haven't understood what true grace and true love is and even what their role is in the church they haven't got to the maturity of the faith and mature things of faith that they can understand in terms of teaching they're still being given spiritual milk with they're still being given you know the milk of the gospel the basics understanding about how we should live generally you know without going into any real specifics it's just basically knowing that this is how you get saved you know you you repent and uh, you know you you get baptized and and you start to follow God and then you start to learn a bit more about what following God is and sometimes that can be a bit of a shock to us to actually follow God, really follow God, rather than just playing at it. And he's talking to these saints, he's talking to the, the Christians, the new people that have come to God. And he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's there, right there, in this letter to them, and he wants to sort things out. So he says in verse 3, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, now there's something about when you bring people to God there is a feeling of love towards those people that you see Christ working in them a bit like St Francis of Assisi going up to the leper and kissing him on the lips because he saw Christ in him it's a little bit like that not that we want to kiss everybody that gets saved but you understand it's that feeling of remembrance of, of what God is doing in their lives it makes your heart sing it's a wonderful feeling to know that you have been part of that process that God has used you to perhaps to talk to someone or to bring them to Christ initially or to to bring the word of God the gospel to people and they get saved but then we have to go on and start to develop and grow uh, and, and become mature in the faith this is the next stage we've got to start developing Paul talked about children or infants young men and fathers to show that there's a progression in the faith that when you first come in you're like spiritual children and, and we have to give you spiritual milk you can't take the whole food yet we need to gradually wean you off of the gospel onto you know, whole food the maturity of the of the gospel in all its essence and how you are effective and talk about trials and sufferings and all sorts of other things and then you grow up a bit in the faith after maybe a year or two you you start to become like young men in a, in the sense that you say well that's it so I, I can handle it now I've got it I understand there's more to it than this I, I've, I've been saved but now I need to to be following now I need to be obedient now I need to see that there's some responsibility here 
And so as a young man you get that sense, a young man, young woman, you believe that you have got enough to be able to start standing on your own two feet. You come to that age. Different people would say different things. It used to be 21. You, know, you got the key of the door when you were 21. You could stand on your own feet. Then it came down to 18. Now they want to bring it down to 16, and I'm not sure that that's a good idea. But, you know, there's that growing up, and we have to grow up in the gospel. And then you become fathers, mothers and fathers in the faith, where you beget spiritual children. This is where you begin to say, okay, not just I can handle it, now I want to help other people. Now I want to really go. And we're talking three years plus, when you've had the experience and the training for two or three years, like Jesus' disciples, they were with him for three years before they had grown up into true mothers and fathers. And this is a, a picture of what we do when we ordain people. We don't normally ordain people less than three years in the faith because, you know, things change, people change. Maybe they thought they were saved and they weren't really and they end up going out of the church instead of going forward. And this happens. Sometimes people are intellectuals and they think their way into the faith but their heart hasn't changed and it's all head knowledge and it's all you know a different story than having a heart that changes to want to love God and love your neighbor and to want to learn more about God because you love God from your heart not from your head and so this is what happens and he says I thank my God up upon every remembrance of you so remembering people seeing how vulnerable people are, seeing how they need God in their lives, seeing how they've welcomed God into their life, and seeing some changes, and seeing how their lives are changing for the good. And it's a, it's a great remembrance in that situation. Verse 4, Always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy. So there's a sense in which we're still giving we're giving thanks for those people that God has put in our way. In the same way that we can pray for opportunities to speak to people about God, we also give thanks to God when he's brought people and we've been able to touch their lives and bring the word of God to them and see the fact that God has used us. It's very satisfying to know that you are part of God's plan and that God is using you. It's a wonderful thing to know that God's using you in that way. And so this is something that brings us a great deal of joy. Verse 5, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. So we give joy. Sometimes we can, we can have a sense of disappointment when people just sort of go off or start backsliding or don't take it seriously enough or they still haven't learned grace and they're still very full of the world and sometimes it can be a bit disappointing but we know that they're babes so you have to look past that you have to see someone's heart you have to be prepared to look for the good in people and not just to see their acting out but to see their heart and see how God's touched their heart can be really helpful when you're treating someone with grace even though they may be acting out some some stuff they may be still gossiping coming into the church they they may be still very selfish coming into the church you know people don't come in fully mature they come in as babies they come in they mess their, mess their nappies a lot you know when they first come in quite often god sometimes does a wonderful work immediately but there are some people that come in and the work is there but they're still struggling with all the stuff that they're learning because they're still full of the world they're still wrestling with the old man or the old woman in them and we we need to help them to grow up in the faith and teach them but we are grateful that God makes us spiritual midwives because that's what we are really we're helping to birth people into the faith and you don't just throw the baby in the crib and say well that's it you've been born now get on with it they have to be fed they have to be loved they need to be nurtured and that comes from grace it doesn't come from you being a good Christian or being a leader as we were looking at earlier there needs to be refining going on what kind of commitment do you have for God's service what kind of commitment do you have 
to the church he's put you in? What kind of faithfulness is there in you? What kind of loyalty is there in you? To be in that fellowship and to be everything towards building that fellowship and sticking with the work that God has put you in the place to do. Finding your gifting in that place, not going off everywhere else. Becoming a spiritual nomad, going around all the churches. This is not a good thing. This is not faithfulness. But, you know, young Christians who are babies in Christ, they don't always understand that. They've never really understood loyalty. They may have never really been faithful to anybody but themselves. Nobody has shown them what loyalty really is. No one's shown them how this is about faithfulness. No one's shown us that everything needs to be out in the open. We need to come under authority. That's a refining. Some people don't like to come under authority. They think they know and they're going to do what they want to do and they don't care about anything else and so they will go round everywhere. Like a spiritual prostitute, just going everywhere and anywhere, listening to voices all over the place instead of coming under authority in the church where God has planted them because that's so important. And yet people don't understand that as baby Christians. And so we have to teach them and sometimes people get offended. They get offended when you preach a message. They get offended when you try to help them to understand where there's some error. And yet we're told, if you read Timothy, where Paul teaches him about being a minister, we have to rebuke, we have to exhort, we have to also encourage. But there are times when we need to tell people they're, they're not actually working in the right way to be part of God's body, to be part of the, the body of Christ, the church. And that we are in a local church and we need to commit ourselves to that church. And then we can have this great joy in us to know that the person is joined to us. This is also part of it. When we get baptised, it's, it's not just baptised into the faith, it's being baptised into that church that baptises you. It's being loyal and faithful to the person who's feeding you with the gospel, feeding you with the word of God, teaching you that as God has given them a gift to do that for you, for the upbuilding of the church. It's not the gift for them. We don't get a gift so we make us look good. The gifts are there for us to build the church. So our gift is not for us, it's for the church. This is where people need to grow up again. Because we think, well, when I get a gift, if I get the gift of tongues, if I get the gift of prophecy, if I get the gift of, of preaching or teaching or pastoring evangelism, it's for me, surely. No. It's given you to build the church. That's what the gifts are for. It's not given you to hawk it around. It's to be used where you have been planted. And hopefully you get baptised, but certainly if you come into a church, you're going to be taught by the authority in that church, the pastor of that church, that God has called to that ministry. And so you're not just joining to the, the body of Christ in terms of just joining in faith. You're being joined to a particular place and a particular church, a particular ministry, a particular pastor. And if that's not joined, then you're just really not, not part of the body because you're not committed to that body. And, and we need to learn faithfulness. So this is something that every, every believer needs to know. And then there is joy on both sides. And this is what happens. And he says in verse 6, Being confident of this very thing, that he, that's Christ, he who has begun a good work, God, the Father, he who has begun a good work in you, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So he, God, through Christ, He's going to complete this work. So we know that, as we see on the front of the, the podium, and you know the banner that says the Omega, the Alpha and the Omega, he's the author and the finisher of our faith. God calls you through his Spirit. He opens your eyes through his Spirit. But he doesn't leave you once he's saved you and leaves you in the crib and says, right, that's it, you're on your own, Jack. He teaches you. He gives gifts to the body of Christ. He gives us teachers and pastors 
He gives us evangelists to bring us into the church, but he gives teachers and pastors to teach us and prophets sometimes to warn us. This is the prophetic gifting. There is the fivefold ministry of the executive part of the church is to bring these gifts to help you grow, to become from babies to young men and young women, to become spiritual fathers. If you don't get to being, become spiritual midwives, something's gone wrong in the process. You're not propagating. You're not continuing on the work. There is a need for everyone to be bold and stand up for their faith and to be a good witness from the heart outwardly so that other people get saved. So that you become a spiritual midwife and you hold someone else's hand and bring them along to church and bring them along to agape and bring them along to prayer meetings, bring them along to any kind of meetings of the church, teachings, Bible studies, whatever's going on, you are there to bring them along. But if you're not standing up for your faith, if you're not giving an account when people ask you, if you're not prepared to be bold enough to tell other people about your faith and to show by your witness that you are a believer and you really are following Christ, then the process is halted. Instead of you being a channel of God's peace, you suddenly become a dam. You have a log jam and nothing's going on. You know, you're getting this from God, but you know, after a while you, you, you're not going to take any more in. So after a short while, it's, you're going to be full up with all the knowledge and stuff, but it's not, you're not applying it. You're not becoming a channel. You're just, you're just becoming a little reservoir of knowledge. Oh, I know stuff. Yeah, well, so does the devil. So what makes the difference? But you become a channel of God's peace and love. You become faithful. You become reliable. You become a great oak in the kingdom, standing there, representing God in your situation and you then become spiritual midwives for others to come to God to learn and to grow and to develop and to see God's work continue this is really important and he is going to start that and he's going to finish it but you have to be available you have to be ready <laughs> it's no good coming to God and saying thank you for being saved and then leave it there I don't need to know anymore. I don't need to do anything. I'll just sit on a pew and just listen. Like a nodding dog. Mm, yeah, very good, yeah. That's, that's an interesting point. Oh, yeah, I'll have to remember that bit. Nothing's happening with it. It's not going anywhere. Who have you brought to God? Who have you convinced that you are a Christian? Where is your faith when you're out there in the world? What are you showing other people? Where is this going? How is God refining your service to God? Is there any service going on? Or is it all me, me, me? You have to ask yourself those questions. And it says here in verse 7, Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart. So we want to believe the good for people. We want to see people doing good for God. We want to see people getting into service and not just being in church on a Sunday, but doing things when they're outside of church that serves God, not just serves themselves. And we want to think good of people. We want, we want to hope that that's what's happening. Because when you have the mind of Christ, you all should be going in the same direction. And the ministry that you've been brought into is being supported so that it grows. And being faithful and being reliable and committed and being loyal to that ministry makes it grow. It doesn't grow any other way. If you don't attend, if you don't support it, if you don't bring anyone to it, nothing's going to happen. You can't leave it all up to the pastor. When did that come in the, the account of, of, of God in, in the Word? It, it's not all about leaving it to the pastor. It's about each one becoming a royal priesthood that means ministering to the people not just waiting until someone's a Christian and then ministering to them but ministering to those who don't even realize they need ministering to this is really important this is the refiner again coming along with the launderer's soap saying look you, you, this is not this is a blemish here you, there's something wrong with your thinking here. Let's just, you know, let's just clean this bit 
and get you back on track to actually serve God. This is what we need to do. It says, because I have you in my heart. I want to think good things. I want to know that you're serving God. I want to know that my ministry is effective, that my channel of peace from God, that me preaching and teaching the word of God is having an effect. Because we're told that God's word will never return void. So something's happening. Either you're going to get offended and upset with me because I'm trying to get you to serve God in ways you don't want to, you're not ready for, I'm too old, I'm too fat, I'm too thin, I'm too young, I'm too skinny, I haven't got enough intelligence, I can't speak to people, I don't understand the scriptures enough, I haven't got enough experience, I've never done it before, all the excuses under the sun, and I just want to see you grow and develop in Christ, and to be a disciple, and to learn to find your gifting that actually helps you to build up this church. And even just being on the door and having a welcoming smile. And even when people come to the door and they're not really sure where they're going. And they're maybe not even interested in the church. But you ha are kind and you are generous of spirit. And you are welcoming. Even being on the door is so important. Helping. Part of the ministry. Yes. I'm part of that ministry. Come and listen to what the pastor's going to tell you today. I'm sure you'll be blessed in some way. How often have you said that to other people? This is what you need to be doing. You're part of this ministry. So this is what we have to do. We have to ask God to give us those resources, to give us the strength, to give us the boldness, because if we haven't got the boldness, then we're hardly going to be able to serve God in any effective way whatsoever if we're hiding our light under a bushel. It says, I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. So even though, Paul is saying, even though I'm, I'm stuck in prison, I'm in chains, you know, and I'm still defending the gospel and confirming it to you and to other people, you're all partakers of me of the same grace. So if I can write this from prison, what are you doing in the church? It's subtle, right? It's, it's a subtle message, yeah? Didn't you get the same grace as me? Are you not saved by the same God as me? Are you not following the same Jesus Christ as me? Then how come you're squabbling and not getting on with the work? How come you're not fulfilling the mandate that God has for you? I remember you with great love and I see your potential for God. Don't destroy that by squabbling and having problems with each other. Abound in love, he says here. He says in verse 8, For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. He said, Look, I'm not joking. You know, when we, when we beget spiritual children, it touches our hearts. We really do love the people. And when they, when they fall away, it affects us. We, we feel that. It hurts us. Because we only want what God wants for people. We want to love people. And we want to show people God's love for them. And when they are falling away and, and almost trampling it under feet and spitting in your face and slapping you around the face and say, well, I'm not interested in what you're doing. I've got my own thing I'm going on. Okay. Are you following Christ? Because if you're following Christ, go with love. Be blessed and go on your way and get on with serving God somewhere else. It's fine. It really is fine. But if you're falling away, if you're listening to too many voices, if you're not following the gospel, if you're in your squabbles and offences, you're not, you're not showing you're in grace. You're showing you're still part of this world and it's winning. So there needs to be some changes. You need some refining in your understanding what it is to be a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ. This is important. 
And verse 9 says, And this I pray, that your love may abound still more. So he's not saying that you don't have love. He's not, I'm not saying that people in here don't have love. Or people in the, in the video, when people are watching the video, I'm not saying you don't have love. But Paul is saying, I just pray that your love may abound still more. If you've been touched by Christ, if God has done a work in your life already, if you've been touched by God, there will be an element of love. You will know a bit about love and unconditional love and surrendering and loving other people. You should know that. That's the basis. But at the same time, Paul's saying, I, I pray that you, get, you abound more in this. Still more. And more. More and more. He's really emphasizing the point. In knowledge and all discernment. So abound in love, in knowledge and discernment. You have to discern, first of all, yourself. You need to be discerning what's going on in you. This is really important. It's not a game. It's very important. And so we're seeing this here, that this is Paul's heart for his people. He says in verse 10, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offence till the day of Christ. So he's saying, don't give up. This, this needs to go on. You need to have this excellence of service and responsibility to God to love one another, to abound more and more in this love. This is your reasonable service to love everybody. It's God's job to judge people at the end of the day. Our work, through the power of the Holy Spirit, because his work is to open our eyes to Jesus, our work is to love one another. That's it. It's really simple. It's not rocket science. But can you love if you don't feel loved? This is where it comes in. Your first response is understanding God's love as a father loves his children. When you understand his love for you, that's the first thing, because that's what melts your heart. And that's what gives you a love for others because once you realize you can be loved that you are lovable then you can love others and unless you have that you're not going to abound more and more in love you've got to recognize how much you have a father in heaven who really loves you that he's not down on you he's not sitting up there with a truncheon waiting to hit you on the head every time you do something wrong that's not our God that is the God that people have made up in their minds because there's no free lunch, right? Nobody ever gets anything for nothing, right? So the world says, don't get mad, get even. The world says all manner of things to us. But God says, I love you. This, this gift of Jesus to us at Christmas is God the Father saying, I love you. I love you. What does that feel like to know that God loves you? And this is his gift to you to reconcile you back to him. He didn't wait for you to reconcile yourself to him. No, he's, he's made the first move. He's extended his hand of love, even in mercy and grace to the point of his own son being sacrificed for you. What an amazing love of the Father to give you that. To sacrifice his son to gain a family, to gain a people for himself to gain a royal priesthood. Wow, what a God we have. And it's all about you being sincere. What is sincerity? To be sincere. You know, are you really joined? Are you really joined to this ministry? Are you really joined to the body of Christ? Are you really joined to Christ? Where is your faithfulness? Where is your loyalty to the plan and purpose that God has for you? This is what he's asking. That you need to be sincere. We don't need to be deceitful. We don't need to cover things up. If things are right, they're in the light. And if we're faithful, then we have nothing to worry about. We have no, nothing to hide. We have nothing to be upset about. We have nothing to get offended over because everything is open 
And so in verse 11 he says, Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. This is the fruits of righteousness, that we also become salt and light. Salt meaning getting into the purpose of God and affecting those around us in the world. Being part of a ministry that is effective and working with people. That's the salt part. Being light means being open and everything comes out in the light. There is no darkness, there's no hiding, there's no skulking around. We just come out and say, I'm a believer. And we show people by our witness that we really mean what we say and say what we mean. This is really important, that we have to be sincere. The world is going to take no notice of you at all if you're not sincere. People are going to look at you and say, why are you, why are you still in darkness? Why is there still darkness around you? Why isn't everything out in the open? Why are you not being open with other people? When people see you lacking faith, and lacking faithfulness, which is part of faith, they're going to say, what's that all about? Where is your faith? So faith one day is here, faith one day is somewhere else. What's going on with you? Being filled with the fruits of righteousness. Christ, he's the fruits of our righteousness. When we emulate Christ, when we emulate Christ, when we show Christ in us, this is the fruits of the righteousness that Christ has put in us. That he is our righteousness. And we become his righteousness. We become the righteousness of God, not before we come to God, not before we come to Christ, no. We are, our, all our good deeds, according to Isaiah, all our good deeds are like filthy rags. But when we, get, we come through Christ, when we are covered by his blood and we rely on his righteousness, then we become the righteousness of God. Isn't that amazing? That's why we're saints then. It means we still have the propensity to sin, but our heart is changed. We don't want to grieve our God. We don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. We want to be seen to be following God. And we want God to be pleased with our efforts. Amen?